Tales of the grueling trip have surely lent credence to the view that ancient China was beyond the reach of Western influence. Over the centuries, the Silk Road sprouted a civilization of its own. It was as fantastically long as it was oddly narrow, lined with imposing temples and thriving cities. It was thought that these structures were built by the Chinese, but it now seems that the architects were a little-known local people known as the Tocharians, who seem to have appeared in these parts over 2,000 years ago. Some of their cities were located remarkably close to the ancient mummy graveyards in the Taklamakan, suggesting that this mysterious tribe may be connected to the mummy people. To explore this idea, the team has asked its Chinese hosts to take them to a mummy burial site. Since the whole issue of the mummies is laden with political stakes, they are constantly accompanied by two Chinese officials. The cemetery outside the oasis village of Wupu has already yielded many mummies. Jacob Satuhola, regional director of archaeology, extends a warm welcome. Then he explains that even though the central government has forbidden any more mummy excavations, he will make an exception. In the interest of international cooperation, he allows them to dig up a grave. Only about one grave in six actually contains a mummy at this site. And many of the graves have been disturbed by grave robbers. Victor senses this one has not been spared. There's no question in my mind that the grave had been disturbed. The timbers covering the roof of the grave were inverted from their normal position. There were no reeds or branches or other uh, materials to cover over the grave that would prevent the sand from falling down into the chamber. The grave goods which should be down at the level that the back or the side is, the lowest point is where the grave goods should be. We're not quite down to that point yet. I can't tell what this is over here, Charlotte. Can you tell in this corner here? Is that a pelvis or is it... Uh, um, There's been some disturbance. It's, in the it's, it's been disturbed, mm. right. There's something else coming out there as he's brushing. Normally we would see the skull or the head before we see the chest because the head is higher, thicker, and we would see that. And, and so far we've seen a chest and a hand that I've seen. Mm -hmm. And a bit of a forearm and part of a leg. But that's about all we can see at the moment. Uh -huh. This... Uh -huh. This is a piece of textile, but it's not a woven piece. It's done in a different technique that's sort of like a braid. And it probably was a piece of, uh, like a piece of belting used um, on, on some part of their clothing. It feels like wool. Oh, yeah, this is, this is wool that's been spun. Uh -huh, sheep wool, spun into yarn. And I, let's see, is it woven? No, there's no weaving on it yet. It's just twisted. For a moment, a scrap of wool distracts the visitors. But Victor suspects something is amiss. Peering down into the grave, I saw fungal growth on the corpse, which would indicate that it had probably previously been located elsewhere than in that grave. And the fact that the corpse itself was quite well preserved, but it was headless, is inexplicable. 
and thus there was disturbance. It seems the Chinese had planted a headless body here to avoid the risk of unearthing a European typeface. They may not have anticipated that the visitors would explore other avenues in their search for clues to the origins of the mummy people. Victor, once again, has unearthed a major find without having to dig at all. In an obscure local museum, he finds two mummies from the cemetery. An adult man, and a girl surrounded by objects from her grave. She's quite young, um, and from what I can see, um, looking at the edge of the pelvis, uh, there's a bit there that usually fuses around the age of 25, and that certainly hasn't fused, so she's, she's probably around 18 to 20 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at her face, she's got a pretty flat face and, and high cheekbones, um, a short nose, which isn't very protruding. And she looks very similar to people who live in this area today, although uh, we notice she's got an overbite. If you look at the teeth, you see the teeth. Yeah. Um, usually many people in this area have an edge-to-edge -edge bite, and she has got an overbite. Um, so she unusual, tends to be uh, more European yeah. um, in nature. Um, we've got some preservation of hair here. And look at the fingernails. You see them? Very They're long. quite long yeah. and don't look like they've been cut for a long time. Interestingly, this, this young person looks like she's quite emaciated. Now, that might be something to do with the, the mummification processes, yeah. um, desiccating the skin. But maybe she was ill for a long time. But certainly there's no evidence to suggest by just looking here what caused her death. She has very little flesh. Her fingers are very skinny. Beside the girl is a water bucket. And then on top of it is a piece of bread and this whole apparatus, including the halter for the donkey, which lies beside her, indicates that they placed things in the burial for her trip to the next world or to use in the afterworld, which were very important, like the bucket which held a liquid, the bread, and the bridle for transportation. The male body, which was discovered in the late 70s, is faring far worse than it would buried in sand. The curators lack the funds to prevent the gradual disintegration of some of the most important human remains ever found. But this ancient man can still offer precious clues about his people. An oval face and reddish hair suggest European roots. His bronze earring and leather boots show his people were skilled artisans. They were buried wearing their clothing. They wore boots uh, with felts, stockings, caftans, trousers. So we know what they would have looked like when they were walking around and alive. The objects they cherished in death begin to create a picture of the mummy people's lives. They were farmers who kept domestic animals and worked a land thousands of miles away from their ancestral turf. This is a, a food item for the uh, local people, and it's made from barley, uh, and they came in many different shapes. Mm. So it's like that bread? Bread of some sort. Yeah. And it's, they, you'll notice the curvature on this piece of bread. This is a wooden basin with legs on the bottom. Oh, it's, uh, it's a vessel for yeah. daily use? Yes, it's a vessel for daily use, but it's also placed in the burial and uh, could have held uh, bits of food or intended to hold food for, for use in their next world also. Noted archaeologist Wang Binhe found further evidence. We even found some farming tools. The woolen and leather clothing came mainly from sheep, so they must have had quite large flocks. Handicrafts were also well developed. For example, they could make clay pots. This was uh, probably used by the priestess or the shaman, the shamanka, the female priestess, to cure people. There's still evidence in this is um, very possibly a little cultic cup 
out of the, made from clay, fired clay, fired very nicely. And it has an extremely thin, when we have this, um, uh, expanding ex spiral. This spiral, right. Uh, this is uh, very typical of, of nomadic people also. Hard so to believe it's 3,200 years old. Cowrie shells from the sea, not naturally found within thousands of miles of this vast desert, give up a crucial piece of the puzzle. They must have been engaged in long distance trade because we see in their graves sometimes uh, things like cowries. They would have had to acquire such things from distant peoples. Uh, these are actually the spindles and this is the spindle whorl. This one is made out of wood while this one is made out of bone. And they're different weighted, uh, so, weights so they would be used to spin different weight of wool yarn. Of all the finds here, the woolen textiles are the most impressive. Woven into twill and tartan patterns, these are among the oldest fine woolen clothes ever discovered. This one has beautiful and harmonious colors. It has blue, white, and red. Also, the design and weaving is so wonderful. This piece is 3,000 years old. Strikingly similar to Celtic tartans from Northwest Europe, the patterns in the weave are like ancient DNA, waiting to be decoded. Are they evidence that the mummy people share common origins with the people of Western Europe? Scientific reconstruction of the heads of the mummies produces a face that strongly resembles ancient Celts and Saxons. Mummy people buried their dead in the barren desert, but lived in the oases along its edges. These islands of green are still home to farmers who have